I want to add to the public policy point here. Um, let's also not forget, in addition to climate change, which people can discuss the economics and the benefits of zero emission sources there, we know for a fact that there's hundreds of billions of annual ben health benefits from displacing fossil emissions. Uh, you know, even if you are conservative, it's 100 billion a year. Uh, and nuclear can do the job very effectively as we retire the old coal plants and put them in as alternative for, for, for baseload. So there's an air pollution argument here that we shouldn't forget. Um, and then to build on David's uh, point on vehicles, um, we need a lot of efficiency. We need a hell of a lot more renewables, but we need a good zero emission base source, source to balance that out. Uh, and so actually, I'm reminded of the musical Oklahoma. The farmers and the cowhands must be friends. Uh, as it turns out, this clean energy future requires a symbiosis among gas, nuclear, renewables, and efficiency, the likes of which we haven't contemplated before, and yet combined can lower the total system costs for everybody. If we deal with these issues in a one-off, everybody's individual costs are higher, and the Electric Power Research Institute has shown that. Um, and by the way, as a matter of policy then, I would say, if you pick a number, let's say it's 400 billion or 700 billion, depending on the year, that we are sending overseas for oil, on good old-fashioned conservative cost-benefit analysis, economics, that tells me I can afford a policy that benefits nuclear efficiency, solar and wind, annually to that amount if I'm displacing gasoline, uh, foreign gasoline. So just, just that's economics for the American economy. So we can afford a lot of strong policy for all of these sources, uh, which also analysis shows we can get to an 80% cut in emissions from our sector by 2050 if we pursue it smart with all of them. Uh, David Dunning, even if we, uh, except for the sake of argument that uh, nuclear power is, uh, is safe and uh, a necessary uh, part of the energy mix, do we have the capability uh, as a country of, of building anywhere near this many uh, nuclear power plants? We've gone for so long uh, without building any. Do we have uh, the engineering expertise? Do we have the skilled labor that would be required to pull this off? Uh, we do, David. Uh, you know, thinking back 30 years, you have a lot of EPC companies that participated in that first round rather heavily. Uh, we built 10 of them, for example. What we did after uh, the 80s, and I'm talking more now to the engineering and staff um, perspective, we melded those uh, skill sets into uh, decommissioning services in the nuclear business, into uh, steam generator replacements for pressurized water reactors in the business, for maintenance of operating plants uh, from 80s onward. Uh, last one we had licensed was 1977. Uh, and then in the cleanup of the sites themselves, like Fernald and Hanford, and we're at Savannah River. So uh, in a company uh, like a floor uh, with our size, we tend to move the uh, capital assets around uh, within the business. And now we're beginning to pull those assets back out and uh, is it a perfect science? No, uh, but we see in our uh, recruiting of uh, young college uh, uh, graduates, more are going toward nuclear now. Um, two years ago when the market was booming, we hired 600 new graduates. Mm -hmm. So we're reinvesting in that. Um, we're also uh, transforming individuals back into our power group to address the marketplace. And then certainly the craft side. You know, we have high unemployment. There is available craft out there in the absence of building coal plants at the moment or even gas plants other than opportunistically uh, as intermediate or uh, peaking. Um, the craft are available. Uh, what about the massive uh, steel uh, uh, forging that's required? Uh, that, that used to happen in, uh, in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, now we have to go to Japan for those, that kind of uh, uh, capability? I'm not sure you have to. Uh, Is there anybody in the United States who's capable of doing that kind of, uh, that kind of work? Well, anybody not, left? Not, not right now, but th there's a chicken and egg. If we're only incrementally adding one or two plants, David's plant, our plant, then the incentive to build a new manufacturing base in America will not be there. It will be the, the foreigners. But if we have a clear policy signal, much like we're seeking for renewables, too, that we want to see a, a lot of this in the next 40 years, if we're on, embarked on building 100 plants again to add to the 100 we've got, 
that manufacturing base will, will return because it's you know big heavy stuff that can be produced here. David, can I, can I just say the focus on the heavy, the ultra heavy forgings, as they are called, for the nuclear cognoscenti, to me is a little bit misplaced. And that, just so everyone understands, a basic two-unit nuclear plant costs ten billion dollars. The heart of a nuclear plant is the reactor pressure vessel. There are two reactor pressure vessels. They cost eighty million dollars each. Each has four forgings in it that has to be uh, has to be uh, done as one six hundred ton ingot. Until China added a forging capability in last year, Japan Steelworks was the only place in the world that you could get those 600-ton forgings. So this country and certain parts of this country with a steel-making heritage would like to have that, that capability back, and certainly we would support that. But I would say that you know, just those are two subsets of two $80 million pieces in a, in a $10 billion. There's... The, 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 sub, the manufacturing supply chain, there's a lot more value added in the pumps and the other specific equipment. And, and look, these are huge job creators. Uh, these, we're talking about 7,000 workers at peak construction and very, very highly paid job because every welder has to be certified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So this, this is a, a very, has a very big economic impact as well as uh, environmental. And we certainly know that this administration is very focused on creating jobs and improving the infrastructure of mm -hmm. this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Stuart, you said something at dinner last night which I found extraordinary. We were talking about uh, the, uh, the issue of nuclear waste, and uh, uh, you seem to uh, be suggesting that uh, you know, everything that we've been uh, uh, taught about uh, how, uh, how uh, volatile this material is and, and what a threat it may be to future generations is misplaced. That basically, you said after 150 years, 175 years, it's really not uh, as big an issue. I, I, can you elaborate on that? Is it, 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 you, you stand by what you said last night, or, uh, or, or is it more complicated than that? Well, it was the biggest flip for me, because uh, that was, frankly, the, you know, the long-term waste issue was the one that freaked me out as an environmentalist all those years. But then I looked more closely at climate, looked more closely at coal, I looked more closely at nuclear, and came to realize that those dry cast storage containers for the current generation of spent fuel, it's a really good place for it because we can park it for half a century or century while we think about it. Um, and while we think about it means we could reprocess it, like the French and the Japanese. Um, we could bury it in the ground. There's various places to do that. Or more likely, we will use it, and you talk about version 2.0 of, of nuclear, we could very likely use it as fuel in the integral fast reactors, which are now finally, hopefully, uh, getting moving again. Mm -hmm. The Clinton administration having them shut down the, the U.S. research in that area, but it's, uh, I think, starting up again. And then, so, you know, when I talked about the boreholes that go down three miles and you heave the stuff down there, I sort of like that because as soon as you really seriously contemplate that, you think, wait a minute, it'd be really hard to get back from down there and what if we want it and the Canadians with their can-do reactors went through this process that was part of some scenario planning that we did with the nuclear waste management organization in Canada a couple of years ago and they looked at exactly these things you know leave it at the sites put it in interim storage where they could get at it or heave it down the Laurentian shield which is the stablest rocket in the world and forget about it and they realized we don't want to forget about it this may be useful stuff and we don't want to take away from the future the opportunity to do what they want with this stuff. Mm -hmm. It may be a, a hazard and a nuisance, not that much of it, uh, or it may be a real value, just as we're now finding with nuclear weapons as we uh, dismantle the Russian warhead so far, 10% uh, of our electricity comes from those dismantled.